Hi everyone, Anna here. I am coming to you at seven and a half weeks postpartum. I had to actually go and look at the calendar to find out where we were up to because it's just that period around Christmas and New Year where I've totally lost track of what the days are and that's kind of how it is on baby time anyway. And I'm sitting here reclined on my bed and baby is sleeping on my chest and it is a million degrees but she's smiling very sweetly and it's lovely. Um, yeah, before we start, I want to acknowledge that I'm here on a Awabakal country, pay my respects to elders past and present and those who will become the elders of that community as well. So I've made some notes so I don't get too lost, but I wanted to actually give you some info about some things that are happening before we start rather than at the end of the podcast like I usually do. So there's three things I want to tell you about. One of them is that if you are listening to this and it's before midnight Sydney time on the 9th of January, I'm running a book giveaway competition in collaboration with the authors of six other Australian birth, pregnancy, motherhood related books. And it's on Instagram. So if you're on Instagram, go across to Anna Cusack Postpartum and enter the comp. It's pretty easy. You just follow along the accounts and you tag a friend and that's one entry you can tag as many friends as you like just put them in separate comments to maximize your chances of winning so the books I'm doing this off the top of my head so I hope I remember them all the books are You Already Knew by Zoe Hark Soul Modes by Carly Marie Life After Birth by Vaughan Geary and Jess Prescott from Mama Goodness and that one is actually You'll go onto the pre-order list for that one. It's released very soon in 2023. Raising Resilient and Compassionate Kids by Lael Stone and Marion Rose, the hosts of the Aware Parenting podcast. My book, uh, The Birth Map by Catherine Bell, and also The Mum Who Found Her Sparkle, which is a picture book that my beautiful friends Jesse Elliott and Mary Sotropoulos are releasing about mid-year. So they're the seven books. Jump across and do that. Open to anybody who's in Australia. I do have to say it's Australian residents only, sorry. The next two things, though, are open to people anywhere around the world. So a lot of people who are listening along to my content have a fairly strong interest in birth and postpartum and supporting mothers and families through all of those, particularly the the opening, the early stages of parenting. So if that's you, there are two courses that I'm an affiliate for that are opening up a new intake. So one of those is uh, birth cartography training, which is birth, birth mapping. So rather than helping people to make a birth plan that's a set of preferences or wishes, it's imagining the trajectory of labour and birth or even skipping labour if you're going a caesarean pathway as a pick a path adventure. So right from early on in pregnancy where you really have to know if I accept this test that start, that's part of standard care, which options will then be presented to me or taken off the table and which way do I want to pick my path through pregnancy to and labour to have the greatest likelihood of getting the birth that I want and how to advocate for yourself, how to include your partner or support people in that process, etc. So that's making a birth map. That's something that I'll be helping people with when I come back from maternity leave in a more formal sense. I've been doing it in an informal sense for a long time, but it's a service that I'm going to start offering people properly. If you'd like to do the birth mapping or birth cartographer training, uh, Catherine Bell runs an online full day training in it every I think it's the 10th of every month for this calendar year 2023 and there's also an online course version and she occasionally runs face-to-face trainings as well so I'm going to put my affiliate link for that in an affiliate just means that the price to you if you sign up is the same it just means that I would get a small slice five or ten percent of your enrollment fee and that is a great way to do things. I think if I have a certifiable course, I'll be doing that kind of pathway rather than pumping all my money into social media advertising because I think they make enough money. Yes, baby. 
you think so too. The other one is there is a new course, the postpartum doula course that I did was through Newborn Mothers Postpartum Doula Training kind of academy. And I also did a breastfeeding support course through them. Now they've combined those courses, expanded it, added in uh, modules about what is normal infant sleep and how to help parents set up realistic expectations, also around advocacy, human rights, and a big focus on mental health as well. So if you want to do the practical side of postpartum doula support work in home particularly, or just have a better understanding so that you can support of the postpartum period so that you can support your friends, your clients in other areas through that transition to motherhood in a more holistic kind of way. They are having their new intake of this expanded course in February. So I'm also an affiliate for that training. Um, I, I have worked quite closely with Julia, who is the the head honcho of newborn mothers training and some of the other educators in that course. And I really believe that that program is the way to go if you are interested in becoming a postpartum professional. Okay, that was very long. Now I'm going to get into my own postpartum update. Thank you for sticking around. Let's get started. Again, I had to go back and look at the calendar to see what's actually happened since we last checked in. So the day or two after I recorded the last episode for you, I did an interview with Positive Birth Australia, which is a great podcast to listen to if you're looking for the reflections and learnings and getting into the vibe of just like good births. No birth horror stories to be found there. So I described both my births and how that all played out on that podcast and the episode will be released I think probably in the next six weeks but I'll let you know when that comes out and then it kind of got into the groove of uh yeah gearing up for Christmas so we had quite a quiet Christmas here I have a little family and we were with my family who are the more local ones this year so that was pretty cruisy I could just sub in and out with baby as I needed to my big girl did lots of swimming it was great she loves Christmas lights so we had a couple of nights driving around uh mostly that was good there was one night that it was a bit of a bit of a disaster with the baby as well and I spent a fair bit of time legging it back to the car and feeding in the car and changing her on a car seat and it just uh, it was a bit of a schmozzle so that wasn't wasn't great but there was a really heart bursting kind of time in that night as well where I was just just cuddling the baby and my older one was playing in it's like a foam machine set up to be like snow and so she was playing in all this foam and we'd done the same thing last year and she'd loved it. And at that point, little one wasn't even conceived yet. She wasn't even a little whole seed at that point. And I just thought how ridiculous it was that this year was just, yeah, just the year of, of her, of growing her, of connecting with her of welcoming her birthing her carrying her feeding her growing her from the outside as well and it just was incredible to think that yeah she wasn't even she was hoped for but she wasn't wasn't even on the proper radar at that point and to have it all in the one calendar year I think really drives home just how miraculous that is it was wild uh yeah yeah we also went to we live close to the hunter valley so we went to the hunter valley gardens big christmas light spectacular thing and that went surprisingly well as well to be able to drive up there which is almost an hour from our place and have both children be able to handle that was yeah again I couldn't I really can't fathom it 
the amount that I was restricted or self-restricted with my first baby hating the car so much that it wouldn't, you know, it wouldn't matter if we were going to sleep, going to drive somewhere right on bedtime, she would stay awake and scream for no matter how far we had to drive. So we just didn't go very far. Like when I was by myself, I went 12 minutes. That was the maximum that I left my house for about six months. I've talked about this before. I don't need to talk about this again. The lights were really good. Um, I have been managing feeding in public places, leaning back a bit. Um, It's still not our best position, but the baby doesn't starve. So that's a winner. The day after that, though, I had all these things that looked like bites on my back. And I was like... I must have I must have had my back exposed when I had the baby in a baby carrier for a while. Um, I've got all these mozzie bites on me. And then the next day, those bites were gone, but there was all these marks on other parts of my body. Anyway, turns out I had postpartum hives. Never heard of it before, but it's a thing. So when you are pregnant, your body is partly immunosuppressed so that you don't reject the baby in the placenta because they're essentially a foreign organism growing inside you. So therefore I got sick all the time through winter, but also when you have given birth, your immune system has to come back online a bit. And during that period, it can overshoot the mark. And so this can show up in things like dietary intolerances or skin like overly histamine kind of responses like hives. So first time around, I got the dietary things and I will probably talk about that a little bit in a minute. Yeah, really problematic gut things after first baby. This time around, I scored the skin ones instead, probably because the gut one is under control. So uh, the risk factors are... Being in the early postpartum period, um, a few specific sicknesses, one of them being strep throat, which I'd had the week before we went to the gardens, um, using painkillers like ibuprofen, which I had been taking for the strep throat, um, pollen exposure, <laughs> just been to the gardens, which is, you know, the most flowery, polleny place that you can be at, and uh, being low on sleep. And being stressed. And both of those things are not super relevant, but obviously my system is a bit more under pressure than it usually would be if I didn't have a baby. I think there's another one, but I can't remember what the other risk factor was. But I pretty much ticked every box and was like, oh, well, this sucks. Um, Particularly when I was reading that they can last for six weeks or even become chronic. And I just thought, oh, I can't deal with that for that long. One of the treatments for it, though, is probiotics. And I continued to take probiotics, as I'd explained in the last episode, to prevent mastitis and to help with my gut. And I think because of that, the hives didn't really take root. Like they, they were only itchy if I scratched them first, kind of like if you leave a mozzie bite B instead of starting it, then it doesn't get too itchy. And I could take some antihistamines for it, which you can't really do when you're pregnant, but I could do now. So I took the antihistamines as well. And yeah, they they cleared up within, probably took a week. So every day I would wake up with welts on di- a different part of my body. The old ones would go down and new ones would come up. And so they just moved around for a week. It looked pretty bad. I went and got a haircut and they were all in the bottom of my hairline and the hairdresser was like oh what's going on here is this something contagious um but no it was hives so no one was going to catch that so I'd never heard of it before but now I have and I put a survey on my Instagram stories and about 100 people responded and 20% of them said that they'd had it before there was also a lot of people who clicked past it without answering so I think it would probably be a lower percentage than that but it's very possible that it's quite common. So I think that's the main thing that's happened with my health. I did have my 
pelvic floor physio appointment as well, which I'd booked during my pregnancy uh, because I left it way too late with the first baby. So I thought, no, I'll do this when I've definitely got my partner around. And yeah, so it ended up that he kept the big kid and I took the baby with me. Again, would have been unthinkable with the first baby's temperament, but I managed it this time fine. I even did some errands on the way home, which again, blows my mind that I can do that kind of stuff. So pelvic floor physio assessment involves a very thorough questionnaire. Um, yeah, the most, <laughs> the most thorough kind of health screening that you're going to have. Then they ask for you to perform a couple of um, like pelvic floor squeezes or exercises. And if you consent to it, they check both your abdominal separation because those kind of the rectus abdominis which is like the six pack muscles the line down the middle of them gets sort of broken open has to expand to make room for the growing baby and um yeah that's can be an important thing to see how those muscles are knitting back towards each other or staying separate and also if you consent they'll do an internal examination which is where they wear a glove put their fingers, lubed fingers just inside the vagina and get you to squeeze and hold or do some different manoeuvres to check which muscles in your pelvic floor are and are not working properly. So mine seem to be doing all right at the moment. They also check for prolapse, which is important because prolapse of the uterus into the vaginal cavity can be silent, which means that you don't know about it, you don't feel it particularly in the early part postpartum where you're not really doing anything to stress your body as you might do later when you want to um, run after children or jump on a trampoline with them or something like that. You, if, yeah, if you don't strain your system, you might not know that you have one, which can then be managed at an earlier grade rather than like worsening it and then having more problems with it. So at this stage, they're not sensing any prolapse there. Um, my pelvic floor muscles have okay strength, but they just don't have any endurance. So I should be able to keep a really strong contraction of the proper muscles for at least 10 seconds and mine give up after four seconds. So they've just given me some activities to do to build that strength up. And I'm finding that I'm much more motivated to do the exercises this time around because I have an older kid to chase after that I want to be able to chase after safely um, and not even chase after in the sense of like wrangle and danger and whatever because I would do those things regardless of how my pelvic floor was but I just want to be able to play I feel really motivated to I want to ride bikes I want to be able to like take her on the high ropes course I want to be able to take her rock climbing because I think she's getting almost old enough to do some of these things um, I want to be able to catch her when she jumps off stuff and not feel like I'm really having to concentrate on what my abdominal pressure is doing so as to not leak anywhere so yeah the motivation is there and I have a follow-up appointment with the physio in February then yeah Christmas parties we didn't really we didn't really go many places um, other than doing Christmas light looking, there was one party at a friend's house and I just took up residence on the recliner chair for a good bit of it and people could come and go as they wanted to. And that was nice to kind of socialize without pressure. Uh, we have seen my partner's family a fair bit. We sort of saw, we saw members of his family six I think six or seven days in a row, but they all live multiple hours away. So our rule at the moment is that you, that people staying at our, at our house can't stay more than a maximum of one night and they were all staying for longer than that. So they stayed other places and we just saw them in the day and that worked perfectly. They all got sleep, we all got sleep um, and then we got to enjoy each other. One of those things was we took big girl tempin bowling now I am old I obviously have not gone tempin bowling for a long time because I was 
blown away by like how loud it was there. <laughs> like it sounds ridiculous because I know they always used to play music and film clips and stuff at bowling when I was a kid, but this was like a nightclub in a bowling alley and they also had dodgem cars and a bar and a full games arcade in the same thing and it was so noisy. I was I I think I almost had a panic attack if I'm honest. Um I was carrying the baby because she wouldn't go back in her pram. Uh, I had the big girl just running from thing to thing, wanting everything. I didn't have money with me. Like uh, just uh, her grandmother was there as well who needs some assistance with mobility and her dad and uncle were doing bowling and not really child caring and I just I couldn't handle it and I I had to go up to my partner and say I need to leave with the baby I'm I can't do this and so they stopped their game after seven turns instead of the full 10 because I just I had to leave or I would have had some kind of meltdown or breakdown in the in the place that's not an accurate word I would have had I could feel like panic rising and hyperventilating and starting to feel like my my vision and capacity was starting to shut down. I just had to leave. So I did and that was much better. <laughs> but, yeah, um, I remember getting overstimulated very quickly in my first postpartum, but I didn't, yeah, I didn't think that, a setting like that would set me off as much as it did this time. So yeah, good to be able to recognize that and get out. Uh, I also had my six week appointment with the midwife. She checked the baby, checked me, everything is going as it should. Baby's tracking along her, um, what's the word? Percentile, centile line for her weight, which is cool. Um, I had no doubts about that. She asked me questions like how often is she feeding, how many times a day is she having wet or dirty nappies, how much is she sleeping in a 24-hour period. I think we spoke about that. She didn't ask me directly for her records, but I think we spoke about it. And every question I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And I kind of could sit there and figure it out and make an educated guess, but... I'm not tracking anything and that feels great to me. Like I think, you know, for some people it may help them. For me it would make me feel more worried and more anxious. I feel like I can tell by how frequently it feels like I'm changing her that she has a good nappy output and I can see she's getting bigger in her clothes and she's reasonably content between feeds. So... That means she's doing fine. I don't need to check those things. I don't need to take her to a maternal child health nurse every week or second week to get weighed. They're all optional things. You don't have to do them. You don't have to use any tracking apps. You don't have to go to anyone else that, you know, just wants to keep an eye on them. Unless, you know, if she was, if she was like dropping centile lines on that chart at this appointment, then I might've looked at something But also I might have gone, you know what, I'd like to leave it a few more weeks because I feel like everything's tracking along fine. And, yeah, not everybody just follows a curve. There are little growth spurts and all sorts of factors play into things. So, yeah, I don't have any apps. I was wondering I might get the Wonder Weeks app. That was helpful first time around, but even then I feel like maybe I just don't want to know. Maybe she'll just be be fussier and then calmer at different points and second time around I just know that everything passes so I'll just wait it out a lot of the time and not worry myself ahead of time by going oh next week's going to be rubbish because there's a stormy patch just let it roll so I don't know what else you'd really like to know Feeding's going well. She's like, again, I don't know exactly, but I, she's probably feeding every 
two to three hours at night. Same in the day. I'd say two hours. I'd say two hourly, probably around the clock. Sometimes it's a little bit shorter. Sometimes a little bit more. Um, I still have a lot of milk um, that I kind of have to manage for my mastitis risk and for her, for her gut health and gassiness. So she, she suckles, brings on a letdown. I take her off. I run all that letdown milk into a towel because it's literally like a jet fountain at her, the poor thing. She can't keep up with it. And then when that's finished, I put her back on. And whenever she, and then she stops feeding eventually and she has a break she probably waits about, it's, I don't, again, I don't know, but maybe like 10 minutes and then she wants to feed again and I feed her on the same side because that way um, she's getting a bit more, just the milk that comes later has a higher fat content which can slow down the digestion a bit because if then I was just giving her that fast milk on the other side, she ends up getting quite um, unsettled in the tummy and I can see We're going to talk about baby poo, so, you know, tune out if that's an issue for you. Um, She ends up getting globs of, like, globs or really stringy bits of mucus in her nappy. And that was was what was an indicator for oversupply first time around. It's not nearly to the stage that it was first time because I was kind of switch feeding, which is where you give, like, the left breast for a certain amount of time and the right breast for a certain amount of time. Um, So she... Yeah, um, with my first daughter, by 12 weeks, her poos were fluoro green and only stringy mucus. And this time around, the poos are still the right colour. There are globs of mucus in them. So I can see that it's kind of like still a risk, but it's not progressing to that point. And so the first time around, you know, I'm going, oh, she must be allergic to something that I'm eating. So I'm cutting out all this stuff that they say is potentially upsetting for babies, blah, 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 blah. I was also dealing with my own food intolerances. So these things were getting really, like my diet was getting more and more restricted. I was getting more tired. She was getting more windy, blah, blah, blah. No, I just had to see a proper lactation consultant who could, who could help me deal with the oversupply that I didn't know was the problem. So yeah, that feeding her probably not using a harka this time because even that little bit of pulling pressure was building up the supply last time the body gets tricked and thinks that you're feeding two babies instead of one um yeah so the feeding is much better and I think because of that and because of a different temperament baby and all of these sorts of things sleep is better too so As I said before, she's having a sleep on me at the moment. She's now having at least two really long awake patches in the day. Um, Like she's probably staying awake for three hours at a time on two different occasions. And then she'll have another, probably another two hour block awake in the day. And then she always has a one to two hour patch awake at 4am as well. So there is a bit of a pattern starting and... Uh, yeah but I kind of don't notice it until someone asks me or until I think oh when would be a good time to do this and then I'll kind of go oh well she'll she might sleep about this time so um yeah we can do it before or after or whatever and when I said before she's reasonably content between feeds I have to say reasonably content when someone's carrying her the way that she likes to be carried like she can be put down for a couple of minutes while I quickly prepare lunch or use the toilet or something like that have a really quick shower again none of I couldn't do any of those things with my first baby so this feels like heaven um and then she'll cry and want to get picked up but generally she wants to be carried all the time and the sleep is working because every sleep is in contact with somebody and if I put her down then she'll wake up again like these are all normal baby behaviors she's not some unicorn like put her in a cot and she'll sleep for 12 hours straight sort of baby which some babies are and if that's your baby enjoy that other babies you may or may not have could be different (laughs) um yeah I think that's most of what I was going to say 
I am actually getting really excited about what things I'll be able to offer people when I come back to work from mat leave. So I think that'll be sort of late March, early April. I'm just going to open up a couple of time slots a week to do the birth mapping that I was describing earlier and also postpartum planning sessions and then sort of transition to motherhood and motherhood support sessions too. I already offer birth debriefing, but I'm doing some additional training to be better at that or to feel, I don't know, to feel more qualified in it, I suppose learn some new techniques as well to help people process all that stuff and then you know I can also offer some support around um, making making complaints if that's something that needs to be done in relation to a maternity service so I think the way that I'm going to do it is offer two prenatal and two postnatal support sessions as a package so that would be birth mapping postpartum planning and then two sessions after a birth debrief and another motherhood support session. And I think that's sort of going to be my primary thing that I'm going to offer um, because I won't be putting this one in any kind of formal care in the foreseeable future, which means I won't be doing in-home support for other people in the foreseeable future either. And I feel like, yeah, supporting other people with their babies while I still have a baby under 12 months old maybe isn't something that I necessarily want to do so that is the way I'm heading with that I just have my journal next to me and I'm going to finish by reading out some random reflections and lessons that I have (laughs) that I've jotted down in the last little while Um, and hopefully there'll be something in there that could be helpful or interesting for you Okay, so I asked myself, what lessons have come to me during this postpartum so far? What has changed in my world in or in me? And the the first thing that came up was everything and nothing. Point one, matrescence round two is an evolution, not a complete rebirth. So I was, you know, pretty cracked open by the process of becoming a mother, which is what matrescence is by definition. And I was wondering to what degree that would happen again. And I spoke about this in my interview on the Happy Mum and Movement podcast with Amy Taylor Cabaz. And we called that episode the second in a split. And I was wondering just how much I would be split open again. And I think this time someone asked me if it was a whole new ball game having two. And I feel like with the first baby going from not parents to parents, it was a whole new ball game. But this feels like an extension of the old ball game, if that makes sense. And the matrescence at this point feels similar. It just is an expansion rather than a whole, a whole world turned upside down thing. But then I wonder, is this because this baby is easier than the first baby? Would I have had just as much things being turned on my head if I'd had the trickier baby second? So I don't know, but I know the answer. (laughs) I know one big thing is that the planning works. Postpartum planning really works. Um, I'm reaping the rewards of it this time around and I really, really encourage you to do it. So, yes, not very practical advice. You can't exactly call this in to have the hard the hard baby first, but um, every time she does something that seems like, you know, within a more normal or average kind of range, I'm like, oh, this is some kind of surreal dream. This is lovely. (laughs) And I know that, uh, that children can, I'm sure she'll just be more difficult at a different stage. Everybody takes their turn, right? Um, But yeah, also we feel more competent in a whole lot of things including listening to her feelings instead of even the baby's feelings, instead of just trying to fix and shush absolutely everything all the time. So, yeah, I'm sure many factors. Um, all right, point, that was point two. Point three, you'll be, you will be pulled both ways at once. Voicing what's happening helps. So even just saying... Um, 
to your partner or to your older child if they're of a little age to understand. I'm finding it hard to help both of you get what you need from me right now. And then you can start to find a solution instead of just getting to that point of complete overwhelm, which can happen literally in a 10 second period. I had one where my partner just went to have a shower the other day. He was gone out of the room for 20 minutes and the baby had had a blowout of the nappy. She'd needed to feed. Um, something else happened with my older child. I think she'd busted herself and needed like to be cleaned up from blood or something. Um, there was something on the stove that started boiling over. Like it just went from zero to 100 in a very short space of time and <laughs> my nervous system was frazzled. So, yeah, um, voice what's happening before it gets to a critical point. Um, use all of the help and use all of the leave. Any person who can help you, particularly in those key points, which for me is like early mornings from kind of 6 till 7 30 and kind of witching hour just before before dinner time so 4 30 to 5 30 that's the time that we're using screen time for our older child but in the morning like if my partner was getting up and going to work I wouldn't be able to have a lie-in because I'd be having to parent the older one and baby always has this awake patch between like 4 and 5 30 in the morning so I I'm accumulating sort of one to two hours of extra sleep every day, which across a week is a whole night's worth of sleep by him not being at work at this point. So if he was at work, I could have somebody come and help me in the day and try and sleep during one of the baby's naps on while she's on me, whatever. But we need to have the support to be able just to get enough sleep. You can't heal and you can't function properly without sleep. Um, start preparing from the second that you know you want another child. So for me, this included finding a childcare centre or a preschool and going on a wait list and then really helping her through a long transition. She was not happy leaving me. She's been a COVID kid that was with me all the time. That has been an essential part of my preparation from the very start for this postpartum that preschool is part of our support network and that leads into the next point early childhood educators can be your village saints Um, next point all parents need to know about safe co-sleeping you will need it when they're sick even if we had not planned to co-sleep we needed to for three weeks weeks three to six or three four and five of her life she was sick she needed to be held upright all the time And that wasn't a worry for me because I knew how to set up our bed and co-sleep safely. If I'd been holding her on a recliner to sleep every night to be upright because she couldn't breathe through her nose, we could have ended up in some really risky situations. So even if you're not a good candidate for co-sleeping, you need to know how to optimise your sleep surface and how to do it as safely as possible. Early intervention with anything makes a huge difference. So as I said before, I didn't get a lactation consultant and had this oversupply problem with my first baby. We didn't see the lactation consultant until 14 weeks. This time I had the lactation consultant come on day three. Huge difference. (coughs) Excuse me. Continuity of care is essential. Having my midwife to call on until six weeks, being a private midwife was amazing. If you don't have somebody like that, Try and get a doula or somebody who can, who can provide that continent, continuity of care to you. You don't have to explain the situation every single time. We're up to point number 10. Postpartum can be enjoyable. Number 11, your older kids will surprise you. So I think the biggest surprise for me is that she was sleeping in my bed at least half the night, at least half the week until the night that I was in labour. And since then... She just flicked a switch and has been fine to sleep with her dad in a different room every single night. Hasn't come into me once. There was another time where we were driving and baby was just, she was just hungry and she was losing it crying. And I'm sitting in the front going, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, baby. We'll be there soon and you can have your milk soon. But inside I was like very I don't know, falling apart or heightened. You've heard me talk about uh, my 
car trauma before, <laughs> car crying trauma. Um, and yeah, big girl's just sitting in her seat in the back going, it's okay, baby. You can have your milk when you get there. I know what'll help. I'll read you a book. And she opens up this picture book that she's memorized and just starts calmly reading it. And meanwhile, baby's still just going, ah, as loud as, oh, as loud as can be. And she just kept talking in this calm voice. And I was like, wow, this is just, it's just modeling things back to me that are not always pretty. But this one, I was, I, yeah, I was really impressed. Even this morning, she said, we were in, we have two, we have two bathrooms in our house and we were in the ensuite bathroom and she's going, mom, I need to do a wee. And I was like, I can't help you up onto this toilet. Sorry. We'll have to, I've got, what did I say? I can't help you up. I only have one hand because I was carrying the baby with the other hand. We'll have to run to the other toilet where you've got your step. And she was like, just put the baby in the rocker. And there's a little rocker seat like just outside the toilet and shower. And I was like, oh yeah, sorry, I didn't even think of that. How can she problem solve these things when she can't, like cannot find the cup of water that is next to her hand and she's crying out to me for water or has a full meltdown when a small drop of that water touches her shirt because now her clothes are wet, but she can manage all these new things. It, yeah. Being three, being three must be a roller coaster of a time. But yeah, your older kids will surprise you. 12. The people who will help you or bring you food will surprise you too. I, if I had been only relying on my inner circle, we would not have had hardly anything come on our meal train and stuff, or our, we wouldn't have had meals brought to us nearly as often because they've all had their own stuff going on but I opened it up I put it up there on my social media invited people in to help me only if they wanted to no obligation I had a week's worth of food brought to me by somebody that I haven't seen for 20 years like I literally haven't seen her since I was 12 years old and other people who have not been able to who cooking's not their thing but have dropped over an activity for my kid or um, someone actually had bought a steam box. If you haven't heard of vaginal steaming before, you can go and look that up. But they, they brought a steam box that they'd handmade for me to use on loan and then take back to them. People want to help you. And like I, I'm saying those things, like the people that brought the activity packs, online friends, never met them in person once. Um, the steam box comes from somebody who I've met hung out with probably three times so the people who you would feel most weird about asking for help maybe the people who are actually able to help you so just open it up wider than you think book appointments ahead of time um number 14 you don't have to be with your baby all the time to enjoy them enjoy how you feel how it feels to be supported and and in love as well I really didn't want to hand my baby off first time around which probably was part of her as well she didn't really want to be with other people who weren't me most of the time but I'm really enjoying seeing other people hold this baby and knowing that she's being loved by other people in our family um, who are visiting us they can hold her and I can give some love to my older kid or just go like there have been times where I've just like gone and hidden in my bedroom and read for a while or had a longer shower because I can and I'm enjoying that this time around 15 there's more motivation to recover properly second time around 16 just because I've breastfed before doesn't mean it's automatically easy there are still things that are hard about it and I think mentally it's hard being a life support machine although now I'm starting to got to get I've got a couple of bottles worth of breast milk expressed in our freezer I don't feel that pressure quite so much lochia or postpartum bleeding is more annoying in summer yes we've talked about that many times although I have been able to swim now which has been fantastic I'm loving it 18 
Parenting the second is kind of like riding a bike. First time you have to learn to ride the bike and the terrain is unfamiliar. This time it's the same bike in new territory or you could do that the other way around. This time it's a different bike but it's the same kind of territory. Nah, I think it's better the first time around. Same bike in new territory. Which is what I described before about the, it's not a whole new ball game. It's just a bit of a variation on it. 19. Thank your partner for everything. We just thank each other for like the most mundane small things. Um, yeah, it could be thank you for bringing the washing off the line. It could be, mm, I don't know, thank you for doing the dishwasher so I didn't have to do it. I, I don't know. It could be anything. Tasks big or small. Um, thanks for putting some music on this morning. I wouldn't have thought of it and it put me in a really good mood. And we're doing this all the time and it just is building this like a feeling of gratefulness in our family and I can see that my older girl is doing it too and, um, yeah, it makes me feel nice that we're – that's <laughs> that's such a crap word – makes me feel nice. It feels nice that we're all – finding ways to appreciate each other and try to laugh as well just nonsense play with the kid um stupid references um to movies or old in jokes or whatever that you know sometimes it would be sometimes it would be easier or lazier just to stay quiet but try and um try and find some humor 21 ebooks are better than scrolling in the night so i have the free kindle app and i also have three different library apps so between those things usually I can find the book that I want to read uh, without actually paying for it which is great so your local library and your state library you can join both of those for free and then they have free apps that you can read ebooks on for free 22 if you don't want to you don't have to track anything also said that before 23 maternal child health nurse visits or appointments are op optional Yes, they are, as discussed previously. Um, I, I don't go to any. I am going to, when, when baby gets her six to eight week shots, they all weigh and measure her and sort of there's a little spot on her skin that I want them to check. Um, but, yeah, I don't take my children to the doctor unless, unless it's for that kind of scheduled appointment or if they're sick. I'm not going to have anybody else grill me about my choices uh, when there's nothing wrong. 24, record things like their face when they sleep. Oh, my God, why are they so beautiful when they sleep? She's sleeping here on me and she's doing all the little, like, the eye rolls and smiles in her sleep and all that kind of thing. She's just started not quite giggling, but like you can tell when she's doing a really genuine, big, happy smile as well. Um, number 25, if you get a pack of milestone cards to take pictures with, throw, throw away the card about them sleeping through the night. It's just not relevant and it will could only depress you about how many years it takes until uh, they, they can have that one. And also in the research, sleeping, if you look at sleep research, sleeping through the night means we're five-hour block of sleep. So when people claim that they get babies to sleep through the night by blah, 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 blah age, they only have to get them to sleep for five hours at a time. So it's a load of rot. That's the list that I've made so far. And I think this one's waking up. So um, I'm going to leave that with you. I have no idea how long it'll be until I do my next update. Um... But yeah, enter the competition, check out those trainings. The links are in the show notes. And yeah, I'll let you know when I'm opening up my booking calendar, that kind of thing. But really, just have a lovely January. I hope you get a chance to go slow and dig your teeth into whatever it is that you really love doing for you. I'll talk with you soon.